some cases that we've come across in our plural practices that we felt raised very interesting educational questions and issues. And so this is not meant to be a, a purely didactic lecture, and in many ways there's not going to be a straight answer. So uh, if you have questions, um, including during the talk that, that you're not understanding or you dis disagree with, please uh, raise your hand, and uh, if, if it seems to be appropriate, we'll, we'll ask you to comment on, on the question. Otherwise, we'll leave a little bit of time for questions after each case. Um, Dr. Matt Abudera is our current Interventional Pulmonary Fellow at Vanderbilt uh, University, and he's going to start with our case. And I'm going to do what I've never done before, which is a very, very rude thing. I'm, I'm going to have to leave about halfway, otherwise we're going to we're going to miss our flight. So apologies for this in advance, but uh, it should be a great se session. Nonetheless, you're in good hands. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> I'm Matt Abadir. I'm the Interventional Pulmonology Fellow at Vanderbilt, and I'm getting over a little bit of a cold. This is not how I normally sound, so I'm actually on the up and up, uh, believe it or not. So I'm going to, uh, to go through this. So if you don't hear something, please just uh, ask and try to clarify this for a little bit. So um, <clears throat> these are, are both of our disclosures in terms of putting this, uh, this case together. So our case starts with a 46-year-old Caucasian male who is referred for evaluation of dyspnea. Uh, he's a never smoker, no significant past medical history worth noting. Um, several years ago, he had a cold, diagnosed with possible pneumonia, had left-sided pleuritic chest pain. Chest x-ray at the time of that evaluation noted some uh, hyalur prominence, no specific infiltrates or consolidations that were noted. Several years later, he ended up developing uh, a three-week episode of mild hemoptysis, some mild dyspnea. Um, an outside bronchoscopy was then performed that showed near complete occlusion of the right upper lobe bronchus, some mild narrowing of that area with some hypervascularity and friability. <clears throat> Attempted uh, biopsy of that area resulted in, in massive hemoptysis and, a, and, a, and an ICU admission for that. I'm not going to go through this in terms of outlining that because it's a multiple choice question. I don't want to particularly give any major answers away, but... Uh, Sure, yeah, we'll have the panel comment on, on the CT scan. <laughs> All right, Chris. So for a plural case series, it's interesting that there's no plural fusion. Um, it looks like there's IV contrast being given through the um, uh, right side, but there doesn't really seem to be much in the mediastinum, or is this calcification? It'd be nice to have a pre and post um, to see if this is calcification or if that's contrast. But um, it's hard to see the SVC with <coughs> certainty. And then there's some narrowing of the right side, and then there's also some findings on the left as well, which again are hard to say if it's, yeah, it's hard to say if it's definite calcification or if it's contrast. And then obviously with just some cuts, it's hard to tell Majid. what the pulmonary vein is doing. Majid Shafiq, come to the mic. Tell us what you think about the CT. <laughs> All right, so there's, um, I agree, there's narrowing of the right upper lobe bronchus, and there also appears to be some prominence around the area of the left secondary carina. Um, there appears to be a filling defect almost, at least on this cut, the bottom uh, right one. Um, I think this is vascular, but I see some defects sort of going through that as well. Is that what you were referring to, Chris? I think so. Just, just to add to that is um, that one, it's bilateral. Uh, on the left side, it almost looks like there's something um, involving the lumen of the left upper lobe bronchus as well. And I guess the last point would be, um, it's, it's a bit hard to know whether it's calcification or contrast, but if it is contrast, there is no contrast within the SVC. I think, I think it looks like um, calcifications. So my differential diagnosis would be that of a fibrosing mediastinitis. Um, and the endobronchial lesion, I wonder if it's a hematoma or some um, endobronchial 
lesion that's going in. Broncholis, sorry, broncholis. Okay, so um, those are great comments. So just move on to the lung windows. I don't know if uh, any of the panel would like to comment a little bit more in terms of uh, what's on lung windows. Just move on, okay. All right, so differential diagnosis. Um, so if you're able to, um, to chime in in terms of what uh, considerations would be, superior vena cava thrombosis, uh, bronchogenic carcinoma with SVC syndrome, obstructive bronchial lift, fibrosing mediastinus, or sarcoidosis. How many, how many people go for A? Raise your hand. B? Nobody? C? Okay, a fair amount. D? Following Pingley. And uh, E? All right, that, that's good. I think these are fair, fair guesses for the most part. Go ahead. Okay, so the, the answer is uh, fibrosing mediastinitis. So going on to that, just a, a couple slides on this. Um, one case series back in 2011 uh, looked at uh, patients diagnosed with fibrosing uh, mediastinitis. It was uh, 80 consecutive patients over um, close to a 10-year time period. Most of them were in the range of 42. Um, it was an equal opportunity offender affecting men and women equally. Um, shortness of breath and cough are the most common symptoms with SVC syndrome, chest pain, and hemoptysis, um, equally distributed around 20% in terms of their presentation. 80% were caused by histo. Um, it seemed to be antifungal, anti-inflammatory therapy was, was really not an, um, effective, but was tried because there really wasn't else much to do for these patients. Symptomatic intervention felt to be usually safe um, and at least um, uh, uh, effective to some degree for a period of time and only two patients died of fibrosing mediastinitis related complications. In terms of getting at a clinical definition, because pathologically it's, uh, it's um, uh, difficult for a surgeon to go in and, and uh, very complicated to go in and to, and to remove this, uh, this capsule, this fibrotic capsule, because of the resulting fibrosis around that. Um, clinically, if it looks like there's um, um, exposure to a prior um, um, histoplasma um, infection, it usually will exuberate, had this intense um, um, fibrotic um, response around the capsule itself that will then directly invade either the vasculature, the SVC, the pulmonary veins, pulmonary arteries, um, the esophagus, and the surrounding uh, large um, um, airways. Um, and it's important to also rule out other, other etiologies for that. Bronchoscopic findings, just to comment on, usually get hyperemic and adenomous mucosa, telangiectatic vessels, and, a, and what's described as a bleed on touch type of mucosa. Um, it may be treated with APC or ND uh, YAG laser, and um, in a small percentage of patients, stents may be beneficial in highly selected cases. Treatment with antifungals and prednisone aren't highly beneficial, but uh, rituximab has shown some promising benefits, uh, at least in a small case series. So our patient was obviously given a diagnosis of fibrosing mediastinitis. He had a complete occlusion of the SVC without SVC syndrome. That previous CT scan on the apex, he had some collateralization of his, of his vasculature. Um, workup for histo serologies was negative. He was started on intraconazole um, <clears throat> just because that's what was, uh, what was done. And then was very active until about 12 months after presentation with a gradual worsening dyspnea. And he presented with, uh, with this chest X-ray. This is his uh, uh, representative CT scans on mediastinal windows, and I um, just have the panel comment on, on that. I know the case, so I'm going to pass. I'll just point out that, you know, the, the CAT scan images, we see a fair amount of histoplasma in Tennessee. I thought we saw a lot when I was at Mayo. We, I mean, there was nothing compared to what we have in Tennessee. So we see a fair amount of fibrosing mediastinitis, and that should be a fairly typical CT for those of you who actually deal with fibrosing mediastinitis. Perhaps the only Somewhat a typical thing is that it's very bilateral in this particular case, and usually it's, it's unilateral, which is good because if you get disease on both sides, you can get into real, real trouble. Do you want to comment on the CT? Uh, yeah, I think the main thing to comment is um, it, it's more what you don't see. So uh, you see all the features that we had seen before, but at least with regard to the left side of pleural effusion, you can't actually see any pleural enhancement or pleural thickening or pleural nodularity which, if present, may have suggested towards a local cause, such as a malignant effusion or something like that. So um, considering the case is of fibrinous um, mediastinitis, I, I suspect that this effusion is also related to that in some ways. Um, of course, you have to keep everything, all the differentials um, open, including um, a malignant effusion, other infectious causes, uh, but it's more likely to be related to the vascular, um, vascular obstruction.
Okay. I'll, um, and again, we just have some representative images of the lung windows. Um, pretty much doesn't add much more to the cases of some mild atelectasis in the right upper lobe. So just to leave it up for some uh, further discussion about the differential diagnosis. Um, it was talked about briefly here, unless we want to have more discussion about that. I think um, if the other differential diagnosis, because if the lymph, if the lymph adenopathy, I mean the lymph nodes are obstructed um, in fibrosing mediastinitis where there may be calcifications, I think drainage may be a problem. And uh, another important differential diagnosis uh, could be a chylothorax. So um, of course, uh, diagnostic sorosynthesis would be very helpful in this case. The other one I would throw in, too, is since we just had some cuts of the CT, you would just worry about if there was left lower lobe obstruction at this point, and if there's a result in uh, pleural fusion as a result of just complete collapse of the left lower lobe. Uh, any comments from the audience? Yep, come, come to the mic. I think if we see the, the imaging, imaging again, the other cuts, uh, the left uh, lower panel, uh, we don't see the inferior left pulmonary vein. Okay, good thought. So pulmonary vein obstruction is a potential cause for impaired venous return. And, and so that's an important thing, right? The, the, the pleural fluid is produced by the parietal pleura, so the, the co which covers the inside of the chest. So this is where all the activity happens, production of pleural fluid and, and turnover. So uh, the, the vascularization of the parietal pleura is a systemic vascularization. It's not, a, not, not the pulmonary circulation. So all of this is gonna drain the pulmonary veins. You get some, some obstruction of the pulmonary veins. You can potentially get a transudative effusion that way. Any other thoughts from, from the audience? Otherwise, move on. Okay, I'll go move right on. So. Differential diagnosis, <clears throat> just to um, uh, just to complete that, um, all the, most of these all these things were considered pulmonary venous obstruction. On um, the last one, talked uh, trap lung, uh, constricted pericarditis, uh, chylose effusion from a thoracic duct uh, injury or obstruction, and malignant pleural effusion, all being considered. So. Um, just for the sake of time and focusing in on the, from a plural perspective, so this is a representative thoracic ultrasound image um, um, of the of the of the pleural effusion. Uh, just to highlight that the diaphragm has a has a uh, somewhat of an atypical appearance. It's not doesn't have your normal dome shaped appearance. It's an inverted appearance of the diaphragm, which um, <clears throat> will be a point as we get on in a, in the discussion. Um, in terms of the pleural fluid analysis, it was serous, non-inflammatory, a transudative effusion. Cytology was negative. Um, triglycerides were normal, and the pleural lacens was also normal. And, and that last point means that the, the lung is not trapped, is really what it means, okay? So if you do pleural manometry, you've got normal lung expansion and you don't develop excessively negative pleural pressures. So post thoracentesis, uh, he did fantastic. He felt a significant clinical improvement um, in his symptoms. He was able to work out, he was able to lift weights, he was a beer distributor and would carry uh, um, big kegs of beer around and he did that without any sort of limitation whatsoever. Um, over approximately two weeks later, he returned, um, or he had uh, recurrent symptoms uh, returned after about two weeks after his initial thoracentesis. So further workup was done <clears throat> in terms of going through that differential diagnosis algorithm, things that weren't, uh, um, uh, weren't checked off. And just to highlight in terms of cardiac hemodynamics, he did not have constrictive, he had normal constri uh, uh, no constrictive physiology, um, so that was uh, essentially ruled out. Um, on further workup, however, um, uh, in terms of looking at his, uh, um, his vasculature, it was noted that he had uh, um, uh, complete occlusion um, of, his left, uh, of his left pulmonary vein, as was commented in terms of uh, where the CT scan was, uh, uh, CT scan's findings. So coming back to differential diagnosis of effusion is uh, pulmonary vein um, obstruction as the, as the cause of, of this gentleman's uh, pleural effusion. So just a, a quick comment about pleural effusion in terms of intrathoracic venous obstruction. I can have more comments from the panel after this. In general, it's a multifactorial etiology, malignance, thrombosis, or any kind of extrinsic compression. SVC obstruction, at least originally thought, was predominantly due to a non-inflammatory transudative effusion. However, more recent data probably suggests that it's mainly exudative, either due to the underlying cause, why they may have an SVC obstruction, or due to a concomitant chylus um, type of um, effusion. 
Pulmonary venous obstruction, at least, is more commonly reported in, in cardiovascular, or va cardiovascular um, literature in terms of the um, incidence rate ranging from, well, anywhere from 0 to 42 percent, depending upon who is reporting it. But in terms of using RF ablation for atrial fibrillation, these patients would end up with, uh, with pulmonary venous obstruction, develop a pleural fusion. And interesting, the authors commented, at least on this particular reference, that the pulmonologist um, did not diagnose the pleural fusion correctly in all those cases that um, ended up presenting to, to that particular clinic. Symptoms seem to improve, at least in that population, temporarily with, uh, with stenting of the pulmonary vein, even though it was transient, potentially in some cases, and it was uh, it's typically transitative, I was commented on. So I'm just going to pause there, and if there's any other comments about that, keep going. So this just highlights a... I'm just going yeah. to add yeah. that it, it's mm -hmm. quite difficult to diagnose in that sort of setting, because you get a transitative fusion from someone who's got a cardiac disease, and most people's first... Um, diagnosis would be that it's related to heart failure. And I suspect that's where the difficulty is. I mean, most mm -hmm. people who have experienced pulmonary venous obstruction, they sort of see patients who get come in with pulmonary infiltrates rather than with effusion, which is a more common one. Effusion is a less, much less common presentation than with pulmonary infiltrates. Yeah. <laughs> So just to, um, <clears throat> just to highlight here for a second, so this patient in terms of his ventilation, uh, he had no perfusion to the left side of his lung, which raises the interesting question is, he had absolutely no perfusion to that side of his lung, is why did he feel so symptomatically better after he had his pleural effusion evacuated? Um, this is going to be the remainder of the talk in terms of where I'm going to, where we're, in terms of the case where we're going to focus on. Um, just to close the loop on that, he ended up getting a Plurex catheter on place and he ended up pleurodesing and ended up getting rituximab and had a good response to that. But in terms of uh, touching on the physiology behind this, why is the patient relieved after his thoracentesis? Was it A, an improvement in forced vital capacity, improved in ventilation per, uh, perfusion matching? Improvement in his oxygenation, resolution of respiratory muscle link tension, stress, or improvement in his total lung capacity. Who goes for A? Raise your hand. B? You get to commit to one answer, okay? C? I guess so. Oh, they're just presenting the same case over and over again. D? All right. Well, we don't have anything to teach you guys. Okay, who goes for E then, since I just said it was the right answer? Perfect. Good job. All right. Uh, yeah, so... Um, sorry, I went back. Yes, the answer, answer is D. So uh, it seems like everybody's tracking on this. So just the last couple of slides highlighting, uh, highlighting this point, um, at least going back to the late 70s, there was a small case series of large um, volume thoracentesis, and they noted that there was no significant change in forced vital capacity or oxygenation or any other kind of um, um, parameter related to that. Um, but they all noticed this marked improvement in their dyspnea after the, after the pleural fusion uh, was uh, was evacuated, and there really wasn't a great explanation for that. Um, at least an animal study in terms of dogs, when, uh, when, these, when these dogs are given um, a saline infusion to their diaphragm, there isn't really, there isn't a mediastinal shift, there isn't any widening of their rib spaces, but however, um, in terms of the volume, it, it, was, it was postulated and saw that their diaphragm actually uh, went down and it, and it became more flattened um, in order to accommodate that increased volume of the chest wall. So from a large volume thoracentesis, at least from data from the late 70s and early 80s, either would show no improvement whatsoever when, when a large volume thoracentesis was improved, or it showed a small improvement in both. But unfortunately, in neither case, we really can't explain that kind of improvement um, in, in, in any situation related to that. So, but one study looking back to the, to the late 80s, um, early 80s, sorry, looked at that in terms of what happened physiologically when these patients underwent a large volume thoracentesis. And it was found that when that did occur, that they had, um, um, that they felt that as they moved that, their pressure volume curve um, um, uh, became markedly, at least, at least generated more of a, from the inspiratory muscles, a more marked negative um, um, inspiratory force and put them on a more advantageous portion of their pressure volume curve. And that was probably why they ended up with more of a symptomatic relief from that, uh, from that uh, uh, thoracentesis. So this harkens back to um, uh, the late 60s, a gentleman, Dr. Campbell, who devised this, um, came up with this concept of, of length tension uh, inappropriateness in which he described this uh, phenomenon occur physiologically. Um, he was rather bold and actually paralyzed himself um, and did not feel any uh, worsening in his, uh, any, developed any breathlessness as a result of that. So how did this look clinically? Well, it at least took several decades later to look at this clinically. Um, uh, a study done in 2007 um, took um, um, patients who had a large pleural fusion, did a, did a thoracic ultrasound, um, and they compared, and, they, and basically very similar to the, identical to the patient in which, in which we present here, 
um, is that they noted that these patients would have an inverted diaphragm and paradoxical motion of their diaphragm with, resp um, with respiration. They compared 21 patients with paradoxical movement of their diaphragm, meaning that was inverted, versus 41 who did not have that but had a large pleural effusion. They noted they did over a liter um, uh, removal of fluid. And all the patients with a paradoxical movement of their diaphragm noticed an improvement in their, in their symptoms, but none of the patients in the non-paradoxical um, uh, group uh, noticed an improvement uh, in their shortness of breath. So they also, they hearken back to what was noted in, these, in those um, older studies, um, uh, commenting that uh, removal of the pleural food is associated with a lengthening of the inspiratory muscles at inexpiration, placing these muscles in a more advantageous portion of their length tension relationship curve, allowing them uh, to, uh, um, allowing the patient to feel better. So it took several decades to look at this in terms of what it applies like clinically. So some take home messages, fibrosing media sinus is associated with vascular airway and esophageal compression and more invasion than anything. Treatment with rituximab may offer some degree of benefit. Large pleural fusions may or likely to cause dyspnea by altering their respiratory mechanics. An ultrasound appearance of diaphragm may predict response to a large volume uh, thoracentesis. And it um, seems like everybody already knows this, large volume thoracentesis will not influence your pulmonary function or gas change uh, substantially. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so we thought this was an interesting uh, case. I saw this at, when I, I had been at Mayo Clinic for five to six years, and I presented this case at a Wednesday morning conference. Uh, and everybody thought it was the, oh, the most amazing thing, you know, that uh, there's no improvement in uh, gas exchange, yet the patient is feeling so much better, literally going from being wheelchair bound to carrying cakes of beer all day. And you look back at the literature, and these old guys figured it out like 25, 30 years ago, we're just not familiar with the physiology as, as well as we used to be, I guess. So, but the, the, the um, take home messages here is that you get called to the floor to do a large volume thoracentesis on a patient that is hypoxemic, you're not gonna help him. In fact, you may actually make things worse by worsening the VQ uh, matching. Uh, and the other thing is that you may not need to remove two liters of fluid, really. Uh, all you need to do is get that diaphragm to, to pump correctly again. So that's another important point. Uh, if, if we have any comment from the audience, we uh, will take that. Otherwise, we'll have uh, Dr. Pingley come to the stage and start the case. Yeah, come on up to the mic. Hi. If the point is the shape of the diaphragm, is there any data to support you do your ultrasound to see what the diaphragm looks like pre and post drainage and when to stop? Is that something that's been looked at? Yeah, and so in, in that study that uh, Matt mentioned, which is a relatively small study, it's interesting that this has not been looked at very carefully. There's a number of groups uh, from, uh, well, you, you probably want to comment on this. Uh, this literally have a large study going on specifically looking at this along with a, a variety of other groups. So we, we just completed uh, a study where we looked at 150 patients, which was a fairly hard study to do, um, who had symptomatic pleural effusion, where we looked at around 20 different parameters before um, thoracentesis or drainage, and then repeated the same thing afterwards to see what parameter would actually uh, help us predict which patient is going to get better. And we did find that there were a lot of patients who had diaphragmatic inversion um, who benefited, but it's not just diaphragmatic inversion. A lot of people um, have reduced diaphragmatic movement, so it's not inverted, it's in the right shape, but they can still have reduced movements, and these patients also have a significant improvement in their breathlessness. We are looking at um, the role of ultrasound, and there are several ways that you can look at diaphragmatic um, thickness and um, the thinning of diaphragm when they breathe and the extent to which it moves. Um, relation to the chest wall. So there are several things that which can be looked at and we are looking at it. We don't have any data to, um, to comment on or publish as yet, but uh, I think that's one of the things which is going to come out in the next couple of years. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to go through the next case. It's a 64-year-old male, never smoker, was hospitalized for increasing shortness of breath. So this is his chest x-ray. Anybody wants to comment? Oh, Right. Um, this patient is from Indonesia, yes. Well, okay, so I'll there is come. a... Yeah. I'll come in and say that there's a moderately large uh, right-sided pleural effusion. Um, but that's pretty much all that I can see. I can't 
see, or there is an nodule in the right upper lobe as well. Can't actually comment on any mediastinal adenopathy, but um, yeah, those are the two findings. Okay. So in addition to his uh, shortness of breath, he also cannot lie down flat, and his jugular venous pressure is elevated with some ankle edema. Okay. So this is his x-ray. So we did a thoracentesis, and it revealed um, adenal carcinoma cells, um, which was TTF1 positive, um, but they were insufficient uh, for further molecular typing. So because of that, um, we went ahead uh, to do thoracoscopy um, after giving him a course of diuretics. And um, we did a thoracoscopic guided pleurobiopsy as well as telt prudrage at the same time because the underlying lung was not trapped. And we went on to do a CT scan, which then confirmed the presence of a speculated right upper loop nodule. There was also mediastinal lymph adenopathy. There was also pericardial effusion, uh, ascites, peritoneal nodules, splenic nodules, and they were presumed to be due to a metastatic disease. Okay. So maybe I'm going to pause here to just highlight certain red flags that are not consistent. In lung cancer, usually it, they would metastasize to the lymph nodes, to the bone, to the brain, as well as to the adrenals and the liver. Finding splenic nodules as well as peritoneal nodules are very, very rare. So the pleurobiopsy actually revealed, um, no, they revealed adenal carcinoma cells, stained TTF1 positive, but in between that, they could also see necrotizing granulomatous inflammation with caseating granulomas, and they could find one single acid fast bacillus, okay? So this case actually highlights dual pathology and um, we went on to wonder whether the pericardial effusion could be due to TB pericarditis, constrictive pericarditis, resulting in his clinical presentation of a raised jugular venous pressure as well as bilateral ankedema. So I'm going to pause here to say that we were rather brave in doing thoracoscopy and thoracoscopic pudrach and biopsy without uh, evaluating the cardiac issue uh, adequately, okay? Right. So because he continued to drain uh, um, liters and liters of fluid uh, following thoracoscopy, we subjected him to a transthoracic um, echocardiogram, wondering whether it could be a constrictive pericarditis in addition to a pericardic infusion, okay? Right? So to the echo actually confirmed the presence of a large pericardial effusion. There was also a very thick exudative coating of the visceral pericardium, okay? And, <clears throat> and the Doppler was consistent with an effusive constrictive physiology, okay? So he does have constrictive pericarditis in addition to a pericardial effusion. <clears throat> so because um, there was some consideration while waiting for the molecular markers to come back that uh, he might uh, undergo immunotherapy, and we all know that immunotherapy, um, if you give steroids for constrictive pericarditis, it could uh, impact on the effect of immunotherapy. Hence, the patient was advised to undergo pericardial window creation Okay. And he also underwent abdominal uh, paracentesis. We sent off all the fluid as well as the pericardium, and they were all negative for malignancy. Four weeks later, the cultures came back as positive for TB. So the pericardial effusion, the constrictive pericarditis, the ascites, as well as the peritoneal nodules were all due to disseminated tuberculosis. Okay. Um, molecular markers came back. Thankfully, it was positive for EGFR exon 21 sensitizing mutations were detected. And the tumor also showed very high PD1 expression, PDL1 expression of up to 80%. Having dual pathology, he was um, prescribed with the standard therapy, which is uh, rifampicin, isoniazid, itambutol, and pyrazinamide. Mm -hmm. 
for two months, followed by four months of rifampicin and isoniazid, and this uh, resulted in resolution of the splenic and peritoneal disease as well as ascites. <clears throat> because of his sensitizing mutations being positive, afatinib was also prescribed for his underlying lung adenocarcinoma, and imaging at four months showed resolution of the size of the tumor in addition to good response of the ascites peritoneal disease. So really this case illustrates um, unique diagnostic and therapeutic challenges of dual pathology, which we really need to think about uh, living in endemic TB countries such as Singapore and also the Southeast Asia. What is interesting is that extra pulmonary TB occurs in 20% of patients with pulmonary TB and tuberculous pericarditis occurring in 1% to 2%. In fact, patients with TB carries a 1.5 to 4.5 fold risk of developing lung cancer that, as compared to non-infected individuals. And we all are aware of scar adenocarcinoma that can occur because of the chronic inflammation um, and reparative uh, angiogenesis and scarring from TB. In fact, occult lung cancer can lead to reactivation of latent TB. So in this case, there was a diagnostic challenge requiring a very high index of suspicion because TB and lung cancer share similarities in symptoms, signs, and imaging. And it's necessary to obtain histological and culture samples from affected sites to differentiate the two entities. Okay? And in metastatic disease, 40% of these patients with lung cancer can present with, and these are usually the affected sites, such as the bone, liver, brain, and adrenals. However, if we note uh, peritoneal uh, nodules or, um, or splenic nodules, these are very, very atypical as metastatic sites. Okay? It counts for up to 2.7% um, to 16% only in autopsy results, okay? meaning that patients die of unclear reasons. And in splenic nodules, it only accounts for less than 1% of metastatic carcinomas. So, and um, hence, uh, this, this is just an illustration of uh, what they can present with, okay? So um, peritoneal per uh, tuberculosis is very common, unlike in peritoneal metastasis due to lung cancer. And um, patients can also present with the three types that are well described, ascites, the wet type, the dry type, where there, there is peritoneal and mesenteric thickening, as well as the fibrous type where the omental thickening presents as a mass. <coughs> okay, and splenic TB, where they can present with nodules, it is usually a manifestation of disseminated form of Miller tuberculosis. And again, it is much more common than metastatic disease. It accounts up to 50% of uh, disseminated tuberculosis. <laughs> So what are the therapeutic challenges uh, as illustrated in this case? There's always a question about the TB du uh, treatment duration, okay? Steroids for TB pericarditis and how it will affect immunotherapy, if that is one of the considerations. And which drug should we choose? Um, because we know that rifampicin can also induce your cytochrome P384, which can then lower the levels of uh, EGFR, TKI, plasma concentrations. Okay. So afatinib was preferred as if the pharmacokinetics are least affected by rifampicin. And the impact of steroids on immunotherapy for lung cancer, this is important, especially if we are, the patients are on steroids for a variety of reasons. In this study, it actually shows that progression-free survival, overall survival, are affected if the patients are on concomitant uh, steroids. And last but not all, uh, least, um, TB can also um, manifest PDL1 expression and PD1 expression. So this can also impact uh, the role of immunotherapy if we are looking at the molecular typing from the tissues that we obtain. So with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Thing.
Uh, it's a good example to show that you can often have two diagnoses. In medical school, we are often told that you should have a single unifying diagnosis, but in real life, it's uh, completely different, especially when there are more than one common conditions. In my own practice, we, a lot, we see a lot of mesothelioma patients, and we also see a lot of pleural infection patients. And um, they come in with a pleural infection, but then you find other features which might make you suspect uh, meso, and then you have to start searching for the second cause as well. So it's a very good uh, example. I think. Chris, do you want to add something? I don't have any other comments. This is a fascinating case. Any comments from the audience? Any if questions at all before we move forward? If not, we might move on to the next case. So Majid is uh, an interventional uh, fellow from Johns Hopkins. Um, He's uh, presenting one of the cases that Lorne Yamas and he has managed, and um, we can have a discussion during and after the case when he comes on. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Majid. I'm an IP fellow at Hopkins. So got an interesting case for you. Let's dive right in. No, no disclosures. So this is the case of a 44-years-old lady originally from Kenya. She was a nurse in Kenya. Has a history of HIV with a CD4 count in the 200s and an undetectable viral load on ARVs who presents with four weeks of dyspnea and exertion and fatigue. She also has known end-stage renal disease from HIVAN, has been on dialysis for a year, and has known chronic post-infectious bronchiectasis, mostly in the lower lobes, felt to be secondary to non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease. And mentions that a couple of weeks ago, she had some fluid outside of her right lung that was tapped at another hospital. We don't know if they sent any studies for analyses, but we don't have those studies available here. Um, got a chest x-ray for you over here. Would anyone like to comment on it? So it looks like she has uh, her dialysis catheter. Um, she probably has a right-sided pleural effusion and maybe an infiltrate as well. You can't really see the diaphragm that well. I'm guessing this stuff that we're seeing on the left where the heart is is probably the bronchiectasis that you referred to previously. Um, and she probably has some of it on the right as well. Um, besides her obvious abnormality in the right lower lung field, I don't really see any big masses. Um, you can see some of her central airways. Um, so I would say the biggest finding is probably the right-sided effusion and or infiltrate. Right, and of course, in order to work that out further, you might want to obtain cross-sectional imaging uh, in the form of a CAT scan, or you may want to do a bedside ultrasound to really settle the deal. Here we did an ultrasound that was um, positive for a very simple looking moderate to large right-sided pleural effusion. It was non-septated. It looked pretty simple. So since this was the second time that she had presented with a pleural effusion in as many weeks, we went ahead and placed a chest tube, a small bore chest tube. I'm gonna show you what the fluid looks like and I'd invite any takers on what you think this, uh, the fluid appearance is. How many would say it is purulent? You can show it by a show of hands. Show of hands. How about, how about serosanguinous? All right, how about chylus? Okay. <laughs> And then, of course, none of the above. So, of course, this looks very milky, right? Although, I gotta say, it looks a little pinkish, too, which isn't quite the classic milky appearance. When I looked at it, strawberry milk came to mind. Uh, I just put up uh, some representative pictures of what other classic appearances are. And as you can appreciate, it definitely looks milky more than anything else, but um, it also looks a little different. I, I think just to comment on that is, I think the patient had a chest tube put in, so it probably was a bit more traumatic than what you would see if, um, if you're just using a needle, and that might have been part of the reason why it looks milky, sorry, strawberry. So that's an excellent point, so that's why um, you gotta pay attention every time, and this is the advantage of a chest tube as opposed to, of course, just a simple thoracentesis where what you get is what you get. With the chest tube in place, of course, you can always do serial analyses, and I'm always a big fan of that. If I'm not sure, I've had cases where I would resend the studies, right, because you always can. So in this case, we um, did the basic analysis, of course, and we found a very lymphocytic and an exudative effusion. pH was normal, so were the cultures. Triglycerides, not too surprisingly, were very high. Cholesterol was within normal limits, and as we know, that's important when you're trying to 
work up a milky looking uh, fluid, right? So chylothorax is defined by a triglyceride level over 110 milligrams per deciliter. A pseudochylothorax, which is what you might see in a case of a chronic effusion unresolving, um, is typically characterized by a high cholesterol, but not a high triglyceride. So what we've got here is a chylothorax, but without the classic milky appearance. And the important thing to note is this is not that uncommon. So in this uh, review from the Mayo Clinic, over a span of 10 years, a retrospective review of 74 patients with chylomicron positive chylothorax, only 44% had the classic milky white appearance. So you've got to have that high index of suspicion. Um, especially if the triglyceride levels are high, right? Um, or if, you know, if you're suspecting it could be that. The other potential pitfalls are chylothorax can be transudative as well, not always exudative. This is most often seen in the setting of liver cirrhosis. The other point to note is that triglyceride levels in and of themselves can be lower than 110 too. Typically, they will still be higher than 50, and if they are in that no man's land, you may want to request a lipoprotein electrophoresis to look for chylomicrons. So let's talk a little bit about how chylothorax occurs. So as you know, the basic thing, uh, the basic vessel in the whole lymphatic system is your thoracic duct. It arises as a cisterna chyli at the L2 vertebral level, um, moves to the right of the midline as it goes up, until it crosses over at the level of the aortic arch, L, uh, T4 to T5 vertebral level, before it dumps into the left next uh, venous circulation, typically either the left subclavian vein or the left internal jugular vein. Important thing to note here is that anatomic variations are very common in as high as 40% of cases, so everybody can have a slight difference here. The most common way in which calothorax occurs is due to obstruction or disruption of this thoracic duct, most commonly from a malignancy, lymphoma being the most common culprit, but also with a fair minority of patients getting some kind of a trauma, especially surgical trauma, and especially after uh, an esophagectomy. A vascular occlusion, of course, can also do this um, because we see that, of course, ultimately the lymph dumps into the venous circulation. The other way to get a chylothorax is just to have a very high production of chyle, um, so a very high fat diet, high in triglycerides can do it, so can cirrhosis. Remember, most of um, the supply of the cisterna chyli comes from the abdominal and hepatic lymphatic vasculature, 80%. And so it's also important to note at the outset why we need to really work up and treat patients with chylothorax. One is the obvious impact of the pleural effusion on somebody's respiratory symptoms. But in addition, um, over time, chylothorax leads to depletion of fat, protein, and vitamins and can cause malnutrition. Also, there is over time depletion of T cells leading to increased risk of infections. And together, all of these can impact survival in patients with calothorax. So question for the expert panel. Now that we've discovered the, you know, this calothorax, what would your next step uh, to work this up be? Would you obtain cross-sectional imaging? Would you go for lymphangiography or perform lymphocentigraphy? And I think I can open this up for a poll as well. I don't know if you have any of your clickers, but you're welcome to, of course, go ahead, pitch in. Uh, I would probably start with a CT, uh, particularly as uh, all the way have right now is a chest X-ray, and we have no idea why this lady has a chylothorax. Right, and yeah, everybody's in agreement with that, of course, to um, to state the obvious. You definitely want to start uh, with the lower hanging fruit and really get to know a little more about your effusion here, right? Uh, I, I saw a couple add. of people wanted to potentially go with lymphocentigraphy. Just wanted to add one more point. I think you said she has HIV, right? Correct. So there's also high risk that she could have a lymphoma mm -hmm. uh, related to her HIV. I'm not sure how immune compromised she is at this stage, mm -hmm. but if she does have that, then this would be um, 
a really good reason why she should develop a chiral thorax. Right, right. Excellent point. So no consensus-based guidelines on how to work up chiral thorax, but um, here's one diagnostic algorithm you may want to consider. This is largely how we approach such patients at Hopkins too. So we'd start with a non-invasive workup. Of course, you would want to send for flow cytometry and cytology on your pleural fluid again, to look for lymphoma or some other kind of malignancy. I always send a serum lipid panel as well. In that odd, rare patient with familial hypertriglyceridemia, for instance, the calothorax could potentially be, a, you know, or the high triglycerides in your pleural effusion could just be a representative, a representation of what you have in the serum. Um, you want to go back to the patient and now obtain a more focused history and physical, look for evidence of trauma, especially surgery, any vascular procedures, um, any history of yellow nails. Yellow nail syndrome, of course, is characterized by yellow nails and bronchiectasis, which, by the way, this patient had and can also occasionally have chylothorax. You want to obtain cross-sectional imaging to better visualize the lungs and the pleura, ideally with contrast so you can better look at both the pleura and also the vasculature. Um, and if you're looking for a lymphoma in particular, you might want to consider a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis and or a PET scan, so functional imaging. If you were looking to visualize the lymphatic vasculature itself, an MRI would be superior. But once you're done with the non-invasive workup and supposing you did need to visualize the lymphatics better, that's the appropriate time to think about more invasive approaches. Uh, the two main options we've got are the lymphangiogram, which is the gold standard, and then lymphocintigraphy. So lymphangiogram historically used to be very cumbersome. You had to cannulate a lymph vessel in the dorsum of the foot. It wasn't always successful. Also pretty morbid because you're injecting a lipid-based dye into the lymphatics that can lead to tissue necrosis or lymphedema. Newer techniques where they directly cannulate the inguinal lymph nodes as opposed to lymph vessels are um, a little bit uh, less morbid. The alternative is lymphocintigraphy. Here you're using a water-soluble uh, radionuclide, and this is definitely less morbid, lower risk of lymphatic injury. It's also quicker. The downside, it is less accurate, a higher chance of false positives. So coming back to our case, we checked the serum triglyceride level. It was normal. Cytology and flow cytometry were non-diagnostic. Uh, we went back and asked her some more questions. It turns out the, the dialysis catheter that she had 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 been in place for a whole year. She had had an AV fistula placed a month ago, which was still maturing, and so she wasn't using that for dialysis just yet. And on exam, she did not have yellow nails, but she did have mild swelling of her neck and face, which was subtle, but her family could see it and could tell you that this was new, along with a positive Pemberton sign, which, as you know, basically uh, you know, entails uh, raising both of your arms up together, and in cases of SVC syndrome, it's going to lead to uh, occlusion of venous drainage, leading to ruber and increased swelling. This is, of course, a representative image. This is not her, as you can see. So lo and behold, the CAT scan confirmed what we felt based on the, the physical exam. She had pretty marked stenosis in her superior vena cava. And so ultimately, she had that stenosis causing not only the beginnings of SVC syndrome, but also chylothorax, it seemed like, from impedance of lymphatic drainage, leading to some leak into the right pleural cavity. So question number two for both you and for the expert panel, what would your next step be at this time from a therapeutic standpoint? Now, of course, we've already placed that pigtail chest tube, right? So she's getting sustained symptomatic relief. That was, of course, the first thing we did from a therapeutic standpoint. Would you now do a trial of conservative measures such as dietary modification? Would you try to ligate or embolize the thoracic duct? Or given that we found she has SVC stenosis, would you try to perform a venoplasty as the next step? So you can go ahead and vote right now, and I'd also open it up to the expert panel. That seems like 100% um, agreement, or it was till 10 seconds back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, just to add on to that, I think um, considering the fact that she has um, a definite focal cause, which could potentially explain the chylothorax, 
that's probably the way to go. You might still want to try the conservative measures um, along with, um, or by the time, till, till the time that this actually happens, you could try the conservative measures. Um, I guess um, I'm not entirely sure if I would leave the chest strain in. I mean, you mentioned that she's got sustained relief. I'm not entirely sure if I would leave the chest strain in for too long, because often the chylothorax will take some time to build up, and um, it might actually be um, better to just take the drain out and let the chylothorax refill again. Uh, I mean, that might be one way of um, managing it, because if, like you said, if she keeps draining more and more fluid, um, into the pleural space, then it could uh, potentially deplete her very quickly. Yeah. And again, often you find that once the chyle fills up to a particular level, then because of the pressure, it stops filling up again. So the more you drain, the more it keeps draining. Yeah. Yeah. The other question I was going to ask is how much was she putting out each day? Yeah, because yeah. the trial of conservative measures tend to not work, particularly if you're putting out more than a liter or so. They tend to fail pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and you usually have to do something else. So. Yeah. Excellent points, Dr. Lee. Do you have anything additional, or and I can uh, pitch in some more here? Yeah, I think uh, we need to treat the underlying cause because uh, prolonged chest tube drainage would deplete her nutritionally, as well as increase the risk of infection. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Excellent points. So thank you. So let me go over again. You know, no consensus guidelines. So we gotta recognize the little bit of equipoise. But I think everybody was alluding to um, sort of this approach. And I'll just quickly take you through what we generally suggest for chylothorax before going back to our patient. So in general, we try to classify, like Dr. Gilbert said, chylothoraces. Um, as low output or high output uh, based on whether the output is uh, you know, under or over a liter per day. For uh, the low output ones, a staged approach is often appropriate. Uh, it is appropriate to start with dietary modifications. Uh, a medium chain triglyceride only kind of fat diet is appropriate as a, you know, as a trial measure because as you know, medium chain triglycerides get directly absorbed into the portal venous circulation, completely bypassing the lymphatic system. Somatostatin or its um, analog octreotide can be used. It's a precious chyle production. Ultimately, of course, you would want to surgically ligate the thoracic duct or uh, perform embolization. For high output failure, um, uh, chylothoraces, these are most often seen in the post-surgical setting, especially after an esophagectomy. Conservative measures are likely to fail in this situation, so it's important to try to recognize this and really be aggressive um, you know, up front and really try to figure out how we can manage these better. I think ultimately, as everybody said here, if you know the cause, it's also important to really take quick steps to try and address it. It's not always the case that you really know of a fixable cause of a problem in medicine, right? And in this case, we kind of do know that. So a quick word before I go back to our patient on how ligating or embolizing the thoracic duct actually works. So you know, it turns out there's a great success rate with surgical ligation over 90%, with embolization over 70%, and usually there isn't a whole lot of injury or downstream complications. The reason is twofold. One, there is a very rich collateral circulation between the lymphatic and the venous systems. So when you ligate a thoracic duct, for instance, proximal to the site of leakage, it does not lead to massive lymphedema in the majority of cases because the collateral circulation picks up and the lymph can now be drained through those collaterals. The other thing is that the lymphatic system includes one-way valves too, just like the venous system does, and those also help prevent backflow. Now, that said, these procedures are not without their due share of complications. So there's definitely, um, you know, leg edema that can be seen over time, and a good uh, proportion of those cases, it does improve, perhaps due to improved collaterals over time. Some patients, unfortunately, are left with chronic diarrhea or abdominal ascites. These are relatively infrequent, but not, not seen. And uncommonly in the acute setting, you could see pancreatitis, uh, perhaps secondary to transient impedance in abdominal lymphatic drainage. So back to our case. Our case actually was a case of high output failure. Uh, we tried, so you know, when you got the chest tube in place and you want to 
stop further drainage, of course, the easiest thing to do is to simply clamp the chest tube and mimic having removed it. And we tried that while we were waiting for interventional radiology to intervene um, over the weekend. Unfortunately, given her high output, she would get very symptomatic very quickly. Um, ultimately, we had to sort of you know, play the game a little bit and minimize drainage for the reasons alluded to by the expert panel, um, but at the same time keep her symptomatically appropriate. So the venogram performed by interventional radiology found 75% uh, stenosis in her upper superior vena cava. It was successfully dilated. Lo and behold, her chest tube output dropped to nil within the next 24 to 48 hours. And she resumed her diet at that time. Um, and luckily, the effusion did not come back, so she was discharged on a low-fat diet. That said, unfortunately, two months later, she represented now with a recurrent effusion, again on the right side. Dialysis catheter was removed this time because we could now that her AV fistula had matured. Her venogram again showed restenosis. It was redilated, but also this time, interventional radiology performed a lymphangiogram that showed, um, and I'm not sure how well you can see here, but I'm gonna, don't have a pointer. I actually do it. All right, so here you can see the thoracic duct here. Um, and then, and I think this is a slightly rotated film, so it almost looks like the entirety of the thoracic duct is to the left of midline, either that or an, an anatomical variant, of course. Uh, but you, what you see here is a bunch of small leaks. There is no very clear-cut evidence of disruption of the thoracic duct, but you can certainly see that some of this, um, the lipid-based dye, is leaking, and everything's leaking to the right of the thoracic duct, presumably finding its way to the pleural cavity and hence causing the chylothorax. So this was successfully embolized. Um, the, you know, the ways to, of course, embolize include coil embolization and glue embolization. There are some recent data in the IR literature that combining the two is more efficacious without increased complications. So that is what was done over here, and thankfully it led to sustained resolution of the chylothorax. So a few take-home lessons um, that I hope you will take with you. Uh, one, pleural fluid does not always appear milky white in calthorax, right? So got to have that high index of suspicion. Number two, uh, pleural fluid triglycerides are not always greater than 110 either, especially if they're in that no man's land of between 50 to 110, you may want to request a lipoprotein electrophoresis on your fluid to look for chylomicrons. Third, Chylothorax can be right-sided, left-sided, or bilateral, depending on thoracic duct anatomy, which is quite variable, but then also the site of the injury or the leak, which in this case just happened to be towards the right side. And finally, I think we need to be really wary of leaving these long-term catheters in uh, central vasculature. Of course, it's becoming more and more common now in the age of um, ICDs, pacemakers, and the like but they're not without their complications, even several months down the line, in addition, of course, to the risk of infections. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. That's great, thank you. Any questions? Hey, thanks for sharing that very interesting case. Just for my understanding, the problem with the thoracic duct spilling is not compression of the duct, but backflow from the SVC. Is that it? Mm -hmm. So the thoracic duct was actually leaking too, right? But, and that's just because of no injury, just back pressure. Right, so there was no one discrete injury that was found. And remember, this wasn't a, a VATS or a surgical you know, assessment. Of course, that would have really settled the deal. So here, what you're looking at is a lymphangiogram, and you're inferring to a certain extent. You can't see the, uh, the contours of the thoracic duct that well, but what you do see is that the lipiodol or the lipid-based dye is leaking in several different sort of areas, all in the same area. So there were probably some micro injuries, I would say, right, again, from increased back pressure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it, it's really hard to show the leak in many cases. In this case, you right. could show it, but it's incredibly hard at times. And one of the things my, that my radiologist has said is to give the patient a high-fat diet to um, give some uh, full-fat cream or things like that just before they do the 
do the study, and that sometimes helps, but it can be quite difficult. So if you don't see it, it doesn't mean that there is no leak. Mm. Uh, I'm just going to ask, uh, one of the troubles that I've always had with my patients is um, patients sticking to a low-fat diet. So how many of you have tried low-fat <laughs> diet, and how many of your patients actually stick to that diet? <laughs> yeah, just the ones in the hospital. And even then, sometimes they sneak in and have something else. Uh, so, so, What approach did they use to uh, access the, uh, the, uh, the thoracic duct or the, the vessel or the, the lymph bladder? Yeah. yeah, so they when they did the lymphangiogram, they cannulated the inguinal lymph nodes bilaterally to get a better sense of the anatomy first. But when they wanted to intervene, they also percutaneously access the cisterna chyli directly too. Yeah, yeah. And I spoke at length with my interventional radiologist after I read the report. And I said, we want, we need to meet because you guys are doing some amazing things and I want to learn some more. Um, and he showed me some literature that uh, given that, I think it's a 22 gauge needle that they use, um, they feel like, and I quote, you can pass through anything. So they did do that. Of course, that's at the L2 vertebral level, so below the diaphragm. Yeah. So I think one of the points from this is that uh, we often think of the common causes for chylothorax, but vascular cause is um, one of those conditions which is probably on the bottom of our list of differentials. Uh, I remember a patient who had chylothorax after he had uh, one of our pacemaker leads put in. Uh, and that had caused stenosis of the innominate vein. And, mm -hmm. and that was identified initially, um, and he had, but by the time it was identified, he already had pleurodesis done on one side. And what that led to was that he now developed a chylothorax on the opposite side. So the treatment for this is often to actually, and that's what the command I was making initially, to treat the focal abnormality if you find one. And in that particular case, at least, he needed similar to this case, an angioplasty of the innominate vein before the chylothorax could be fixed. I think we are nearly running out of time, so I might get one last comment from Chris and Ping, and then we should close. Um, yeah, I, I would say, uh, so I work in a thoracic surgery department, so actually we see a fair share of these because they do a decent amount of esophagectomies. Um, the sur what, what I would say is that the surgical patients tend to be very different than the medical patients in that uh, the vast majority of them, like your slide had shown, uh, tend to be in the high output range. Uh, they almost all go back to surgery, uh, or they have become more useful of the IR folks because they're doing exactly what you described, where they puncture the inguinal lymph nodes and then they puncture the cisterna if the surgeons don't want to or for some other reason have decided that they're not a surgical candidate um, or that they prefer not to go back in for them. Um, but we do see a fair amount of them. And your trick with the radiology folks, <coughs> excuse me, is actually something that they commonly do. You know, most people go to the OR uh, NPO, uh, but in the pre-op holding room, they oftentimes will give them heavy cream or milk right before they go in when they know they're trying to do a ligation because it makes it so much easier. They say it just spills inside the chest and it's very easy to find the location. Do you know anything about the literature of using coils and glue for thoracic duct repair? How long does it last? How long does yeah. it last? Um, no, I, I don't think anybody's... Effective. Yeah, effective, so very effective. Uh, they coat 70, upwards of 70 to 80% success rates with embolization. And like I said, um, the current literature suggests maybe combining coil and glue are a little bit better. But uh, the few studies that I looked at, I don't think anybody's really looked at long-term outcomes in terms of how long do they last and does it recur and such. I don't think anybody's really seriously looked at that. I don't know if you're aware of anything. Short-term fo short follow-up studies only. Any comments from the crowd? Well, if not, thank you for coming. You're faithful for having stuck to <laughs> till 5 o'clock last session on the last day. So thanks, everyone. And thanks, King um, and Majid and Chris. Thank you. Will you be there, any of you, at the Pluralivius course? Yes? Is the Hopkins Oh, no, I won't. No? Great. Nice to meet you. Yeah.
this is why I completely agree with you. And that's why it always bothered me, right? That's why I did some research. And I'm going to show you this slide again. But um, I know what you mean. But um, I'll show you this.